Hi, so together with Cyril Boubier, we recorded this brief presentation for our 2020 PKC paper. So hopefully it's somewhat watchable. So the context of this talk is integer factorization. As you may know, the best known algorithm when you want to factor a very big integer is the number field sieve. The current record from February 2020 is a 250-digit uh, RSA number uh, that was factored uh, using the open source software CADO-NFS. So the number field sieve algorithm has uh, different steps. Uh, one of the step one of the first step is called the sieving phase. And part of this sieving phase uh, consists of breaking into primes, millions or even billions of, say, medium-sized integers. This step is called cofactorization. And uh, the time spent in cofactorization is uh, rather important. Um, we estimate that it was about one third of the time for a previous record uh, of RSA 768. So when you want to do that, the uh, usual method that you pick to find those uh, prime factors of medium-sized integers is the elliptic curve method. So um, I will not uh, enter into the details of ECM uh, by lack of time, but uh, the only thing you need to know to understand the rest of the talk is that the Step one of ECM simply consists of computing a very big uh, scalar multiplication k times p, where p is a point on an elliptic curve, and k is a special number uh, that is the product of all the primes up to some uh, predetermined bound b1. And uh, all the prime, actually, uh, we mean all the prime powers. So, as you can see on the example, if we pick b1 is 32, uh, then the scalar k is going to be 2 to the 5 times 3 to the 3 times 5 square times then all the uh, primes up to 31. So in order to do that, to compute k times p, we can think of two rather naive options. The first one is to evaluate the integer k and then to compute the scalar multiplication k times p. Or we can take the primes one after the other and accumulate the result uh, in the uh, in the current point. And the the best option out of these two is, well, depends on the way you perform this column replication, either the k times p or the uh, prime times p. So when we want to do that uh, as part of cofactorization in the uh, number of sieves context, uh, what do we have? Uh, we usually know that the integer that we want to uh, break into primes have a size of roughly 150 digits. Of course, it depends on the uh, size of the integer uh, you want to factorize using NFS, but this is more or less what you expect. Uh, we also know that the, the, these integers have no small factors. Uh, they have been uh, eliminated uh, by the sieving phase, and usually we expect uh, numbers to have three or four uh, factors. What do we know also is that the uh, bound B1 are usually rather small and fixed. That's important. They can be fixed in your uh, implementation. For example, if you use the CADO NFS, uh, B1 values uh, go from 100 and 105 to uh, 8192. So the result is that k, the scalar in all case for all these b1 values, k is known in advance. So the goal is to design some kind of optimal algorithm for computing k types p for those b1 values. So the first algorithm that uses something rather different than the two naive options I uh, mentioned before uh, is due to Dixon and Lenstra. Uh, their idea was to regroup some of the primes into uh, what we're going to call blocks for the rest of this talk in order to reduce the number of addition. For, for example, in the formula, you see that uh, you can write k as a product of, well, uh, some of the products of well-chosen primes. And the best is to show an example. Uh, I pick three primes, p1, p2, and p3, uh, and uh, give their Hamming weight 
because uh, for example, if you use the double in algorithm for the scalar multiplication, you know that the number of addition is uh, equal to the Hamming weight minus one. So the first prime has Hamming weight 10, the second 16 and the third 11. But in, if now you consider the product of those three primes, then you can see that the Hamming weight of the product is only eight. So it's uh, much more efficient to compute P1 times P2 times P3 and then multiply this number by p then uh, taking the primes one after the other so that was the um, the idea of uh, dixon and lenstra they implemented this algorithm but of course finding the uh, combination of all the prime was uh, way too expensive so it's, uh, the limitation what they only consider block of at most three primes uh, some years later uh, boss and klein uh, proposed uh, a nice improvement uh, as I just said, it was just not possible to consider uh, bluff blocks of more than three primes. Uh, it was way too expensive for practical B1 values. So instead, they used the opposite strategy. They generated a huge number of integer with very low Hamming weight because they knew that uh, their, the corresponding scalar multiplication will have a small number of addition. And for those numbers, uh, they checked for smoothness. Let's pick an example uh, with the small value of B1 of 32. Uh, the first one has Hamming weight 3. And as you can see, if you uh, evaluate the uh, integer that corresponds to this uh, binary string, uh, you can see that it's a B1 smooth value, meaning that all the prime factors of this number are less than B1. So we save this number and we, we hopefully can uh, use it uh, for the algorithm. The second uh, binary string has also having weight 3, but this time uh, it's not B1 smooth because one of the factor is uh, greater than 32. So we don't keep this one. And of course, we can also consider a uh, sign representation as we have with the NAF, for example, and the third example as having weight 2 uh, and is also uh, B1 smooth. So, so we, we keep this one. So the idea of Bose and Kleinu was to generate a huge number of uh, number of that form, check for smoothness, keep those that were smooth, and try to recombine everything uh, in an early optimal way. So uh, another um, parameter that is uh, important when you implement ECM is which curve model uh, do you want to pick? Well, it's not clear. Uh, it depends on uh, different things. Uh, we usually have um, two competitors, uh, the original Montgomery option using the Montgomery, Montgomery curves uh, as different advantages. Uh, for example, you can represent the, uh, the points using, using only the X and Z coordinate. Uh, it has very efficient doubling. You can enjoy tripling if you want. Uh, a, a, a kind of a bad point is that the we don't have a usual addition. We only have what we call a differential addition. Uh, we'll get back to that in a, in a few minutes. Um, then, because of this uh, restriction on addition, uh, the scalar multiplication is also somewhat uh, constrained and we need to uh, generate something that is called Lucas chain. On the other hand, uh, Edward curve uh, has very good, very good arithmetic, the doubling, tripling and addition. You can use the algorithm of your choice for scalar multiplication and it the, um, the the best choice between the two is, is not clear. In this work, uh, we uh, used an, a theorem uh, that says that every every Edward twisted Edward curve is irrationally equivalent to a Montgomery curve. So we try to use the best of both worlds. So what is the uh, contribution of this work? Um, so as I just said, uh, we try to uh, use a good mix of Montgomery and Edward curve. Uh, and for that, we uh, the algorithm works as follows. We start the computation on a twisted Edward curves. Uh, at some point, uh, we'll see later, we switch to uh, the equivalent Montgomery curve. And for that, we introduce the, uh, a new operation that is called add M, uh, given two points in uh, Edward's coordinate. Uh, we can compute the sum P1 plus P2 on the corresponding uh, Montgomery curve in X, Z coordinate only. 
and this operation costs only four multiplication. Uh, this operation is uh, partial, uh, but that is sufficient for uh, this context. And then we can finish the computation on the Montgomery curve, including the step two of ECN, which uh, we're not going to talk about in this presentation. And then for the uh, scalar multiplication, we will um, we have proposed an extension of Boss and Kleinung's algorithm uh, in two ways. The first is uh, with the, um, the generation of blocks of uh, various types uh, beyond the usual, usual NAF and also a better uh, combination algorithm. Okay, so block generation. So in order to take advantage of fast tripling operation on Edwards curve, we consider double base expansions and double base chain. Uh, in that form, a number is written as a sum of mixed powers of two and three. Uh, in the picture below, uh, the uh, dots are, are represented according to the uh, corresponding powers of 2 and 3. You have the powers of 2 on the x-axis, uh, the power of 3 on the y-axis, and each dot corresponds to a term of this sum. And as an example, I give you an integer that can be written as a sum of three terms of that form. And if you use this representation to compute your scalar multiplication, you will need 11 doubling, that is the lar larger uh, power of 2, seven triplings, the larger power of three, and only two addition. <coughs> and you may need to pre-compute three points. Uh, double base chains are uh, subsets of double base expansion. Uh, it's the same representation as a sum of mixed powers of two and three, but you uh, have extra divisibility conditions on the terms. Uh, that allows to uh, compute without pre-computing points. And in this example, we have a double base chain with only two terms um, that requires 12 doublings, eight triplings, and only one addition. So that's for uh, Edward curve. On Montgomery curve, we do not have uh, a classical addition. We only have a differential addition, meaning that if you want to compute P plus Q, you need P, Q, but you also need the difference between P and Q. And uh, if you want to use this differential addition to compute your scalar multiplication, you need to use what is called Lucas chain. This is exactly a chain that satisfies the above condition. Uh, a term in the, in the sequence um, is defined as the sum of two previous terms, but you also need to ensure that the difference of these two terms uh, belongs to the chain. One way uh, to produce Lucas chain is, uh, was proposed by Peter Montgomery in the PRAC algorithm. Uh, I'm not going to explain the PRAC algorithm here, but um, you can see this algorithm as um, a big switch algorithm. You have a rule uh, A given um, according to some invariance, and you can have a corresponding sequence of operation, and then rule B, etc., and you have a some number of rules. The way we produce a Lucas chain in the same vein as before. We uh, simply generate short words on the alphabet A, B, C, up to J uh, that correspond to the rules. Uh, that means that we generate some short Lucas chain, then we compute the corresponding integer and test for smoothness as we did before. So for the overall block generation, uh, we use a strategy that was similar to Boss and klein Young by uh, um, considering the uh, reverse approach, uh, we consider a very large number of blocks of each type, double base expansion, chains, and Lucas chain. We uh, eliminated the uh, blocks that did not correspond to uh, smooth integers. And also, if, for example, we had a block of a double base expansion and a double base chain that represented the same integer, we only kept the uh, double base chain because we had no precomputation involved. So in total, uh, we generate quite a lot of numbers, uh, as you can see on this uh, table, and it took about uh, 10,000 hours of intensive computation to produce all these blocks. Uh, when you compute such a big amount of uh, objects, uh, especially computational, uh, combinatorial object, you want to make sure you do, you, you do not compute the same object twice, so that's what we did, and no block was generated more than once. 
So for the uh, rest of the talk and the block combination and the result, I will uh, give the uh, screen to Cyril that will uh, finish the presentation. Thank you. We are now going to see uh, how to use the block that we just generated to compute the scalar multiplication in ECM. So for small value of B1, like in the example B1 equal 32, it's quite easy to find a way to use them to compute the scalar multiplication, for example, by using uh, eight blocks and one block on the one double base chain on the twisted Edwards curves and seven Lucas chain on the corresponding Montgomery curve. So the goal here is to find, given a B1 value, the subset of all the generated blocks with the smallest smallest cost, uh, such that the product of the integers represented by those blocks is exactly k, which means that the, the subset of the block allows us to compute the scalar multiplication in ECM with the given value b1. So here, by the cost, we mean the sum of the arithmetic cost, which is just counting the number of multiplication and squaring that are needed. In their paper, Boss and Klenium propose a greedy algorithm to combine the blocks. Their algorithm is very fast, the gener it generates good solutions, but not optimal ones. In order to do that, they use two values to choose the best block that they add in the current solution set. So the first value is the, number, is the ratio between the number of doubling and the number of addition. And the second value is a score function that they design to favor blocks with a large number of large factors. They also propose a randomized version of their algorithm in which they only choose the best block with a given probability or else just they choose the second block or the third block, etc. etc. It's all of them to generate lots of solutions and to keep the best one. When we try to adapt Boss and Klenyong's algorithm to our setting, we encounter multiple problems. First, we look at the ratio between the number of doublings and the number of additions that they use to sort the blocks. The first problem was that we use triplings, so we need to add this in the ratio. But also, we use both Twisted Edward and Montgomery curves, where the cost of addition and doubling are different. So it was not easy and straightforward to find one single value to replace, to replace this ratio. We also observe that the score function does not always achieve its goal to favor blocks with large factors. We were able to find examples where their score function was favoring blocks with smaller factor or less factor. Like the ratio between the number of addition and the number of doubling, we were not able to find a suitable replacement for the score function. We first try to sort the block by arithmetic cost per bit, but it does not yield better result. Here, by arithmetic cost per bit, we mean that we divide the arithmetic cost, the number of multiplication and squaring needed to compute the block, by the number of bits of the integers that the block is re representing. So, we wanted to do something more exhaustive, but a complete exhaustive search is totally out of reach, even for small B1 values. So we try to reduce the enumeration, the exhaustive search. So first, we shrink the enumeration depth by using an upper bound on the number of blocks in a solution set. So here we lose solutions, but we hope that the best solutions and the good solutions as have a small number of blocks. Then we find a way to reduce the enumeration width at each step using the knowledge of an upper bound on the minimal cost. Using this, we do not lose any solution. First, note that an upper bound on the minimal cost can be found with any method, like Boss and Klenyung's algorithm or the double and method. Using this knowledge, at each step of the exhaustive enumeration, we are able to compute an upper bound on the arithmetic cost per bit of a block that can be added to the current set if we want to obtain a solution with a smaller cost. So now we can describe our algorithm. First, 
we sort the set of all generated blocks by increasing value of the arithmetic cost per bit. Then we enumerate deep depth first all subsets of blocks of size less than a given bound. At each step of the enumeration, we use the upper bound on the arithmetic cost per bit to discard inadmissible blocks. The bound on the arithmetic cost of the best solution can be update, updated throughout the algorithm, which means that as we obtain better solution with smaller cost, we, ob we obtain sharper bound for the arithmetic cost per bit at each enumeration step. Now let's look at results that we obtain with this algorithm. First, let's look at the best solution that we found for B1 equals 105, which is the smallest B1 value used by CADO NFS during the cofactorization step. Here we can see that with this solution, we use both the twisted Edwards curves and the Montgomery curves. We use double base chain and double base expansion with triplings on the twisted Edward curves, and we use Lucas chains on the Montgomery curves. Now let's compare our results with other implementation of ECM. We looked at the implementation of ECM in CADO NFS, which use Montgomery curves. Then we looked at other implementation of ECM using twisted Edward curves like EECM MPFQ or ECM at work or an implementation of ECM on Calre. We compare using the number of multiplication needed to compute the scalar multiplication with, which, with what we call the arithmetic cost. And for all B1 value that we looked at and for all small B1 value, we are always better by a few percent than the, all the other implementation of ECM. If we look at the graph for lots of B1 value of the arithmetic cost per bit of the solution that we found, we can see that with our method, we always found a solution with an arithmetic cost per bit between 7.6 and 7.7. .7. And all the other solutions have, have higher arithmetic cost per bit. We then implemented our method in CADO NFS and we rerun some parts of the cofactorization co step uh, for RSA 200 and RSA 220. And we observe that with our uh, algorithm for the scalar multiplication in ECM for the cofactorization step, the time decreased by 5 to 10 percent, which correspond to what we estimate from our theoretical results. To conclude, in this talk, we proposed a new and better implementation of ECM in the context of NFS cofactorization. Following the idea from Dixon and Langstra and Boss and Klein Young, we generated blocks of various types like double base chains, double base extension and Lucas chain, and we combined them using a new quasi exhaustive approach for various B1 values. Our ECM implementation used both twisted Edwards curves and Montgomery curves, used a new addition and switch operation to go from two points in a twisted Edwards curve to, a, to their addition on the Montgomery model, and used not only NAF, but also double base expansions and chain, and also prac generated Lucas chain. All our results and our source code are available at the following address. Thank you for your attention.